Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. And part of the mission of the company was, let's benefit the region, not just by attracting talent to the region, not just by making our seven original companies stronger, more competitive, but by also making uh, companies in the region more secure Mm -hmm. and helping them to become more competitive as well. Hey everybody, it's Scott. It's Wednesday and it's the Pitchworks Podcast. Thanks for tuning in this week. I took a trip down Route 70, ended up in Columbus talking to Matt Wald. Uh, Matt is with the Columbus Collaboratory, which I'm going to let him do a lot of the explaining, but it's a really cool story about how seven major, major corporations are working together, sharing data on cybersecurity, machine learning, practical applications, there's there's a, a lot of questions you're going to have because this doesn't seem like it fits into what we expect from new initiatives or big companies. It's it's behavior that's out of character, and I think you're going to like this story quite a bit. All right, now coming to you from the road at the Columbus Collaboratory. Am I saying that right? You are. Matt Wald, how are you, sir? I am great. Uh, thanks for having me. So we were connected by our good friend, Greg Katikia, who is not just an asset to the Pittsburgh community, apparently, but he has made his way out here to Columbus. I would love to know the background on that story, but I want to focus on what you're doing here because I think there's there's enough to fill two shows, and I don't really want to <laughs> I don't want to slow down. So if you will, if you wouldn't mind, the collaboratory is basically seven companies that are of tremendous import working together to basically create an eighth company. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's, that's right. It, it started, if I can take you back a little bit, yeah, please. it started back in 2008, 2009 when the big crash happened. Yeah. And I think some local executives and economic developers got together and they said, you know what, we've got to do something to try to help add to the economic uh, output of the region in yeah. tech, grow jobs, high paying jobs, uh, there's there's going to be a talent issue. So what can we do together? And there's an organization here in town called the Columbus Partnership, and it's made up of um, the, the major CEOs in the region. What they said was, why don't we bring together our uh, economic developers and the business community to create a company right. where collaboration is really the underpinning of it? And the belief was that if these companies collaborate together, uh, they can accelerate their own maturity in critical areas of technology, make themselves more innovative, generate synergies, uh, and attract talent to the region. If you don't inject your own innovation, someone's not going to just deliver it off of a boxcar. Well, I think that's right. And, and you know, you have very strong competition in the Valley and other yeah. parts of the country. And so you have to create your own you know, special sauce. Do you, you feel will. like, like a lot of people moved away because of Valley stuff? Like the, the, I, I see Silicon Valley as a, as a talent suck, like a, a, like their whole job companies, notwithstanding economic value, notwithstanding it all starts from a recruitment footing. Does that feel right to you? It does. I think the, the interesting thing about that is, is there's so much hyper wage inflation now that what we see is a return of companies to the Midwest. Yes. And, uh, the economic developers, are now seeing an opportunity to recruit companies to this region. Now, of course, that's going to create its own talent uh, shortage, but there's no oversupply of talent in critical areas where, uh, you know, where we operate, for example. And so I think they're seeing the effects of that out there now. And uh, I think we're going to see a, uh, a resurgence of the Midwest and other parts of the country who really, really focus on economic development around tech in part because of the opportunity to capitalize on what's going on with talent in the coast. I've read it in a couple different places that the Midwest is where the smart money is moving and, and reasonable people can disagree on this, but I would say the Valley made a couple of mistakes with what they did with wages and what they did with diversity and a couple of different things that we can now 
learn from. And it is, it's an iterative process. I know you're shocked to hear that in a podcast that talks a lot about like startups and innovation and what, but it's an iterative process. We saw what they did and we tried to improve on it. And now here we are sort of in the middle of the, the country without having to go and remake something that we broke. We're starting something fairly greenfield. I don't know. You, you may not agree with that. No, I, I, I think you're right. First of all, there are incredibly talented people in the valley and some of the other larger yeah they stole them from uh, us <laughs> well i don't know about that but but the, i mean in, incredible models to to look at and you know we've recruited or, or the, an organization came here uh by the name of drive capital oh yeah uh, and uh, mark kwame who runs that organization came from the west coast and you know he brought with that, I'm sure, a lot of experience and know-how that he's been able to learn from and to adapt it to the Midwest. So I think it's, I think you're right. It's an evolutionary thing. Needs uh, to be. Yeah, we're never going to get it 100 percent right. We're trying to get it less wrong than last time. Again, just like a startup. Yeah. Well, well, there's another thing too. I mean, the Midwest is got a, a large industrial base. Very much so. And with the movement of IoT and whatnot, now all of a sudden, this part of the country is very important. Uh, to robotics and IoT because of the opportunities to automate and drive productivity, further productivity and, and automation and manufacturing and all the job creation that would result from that. So I, I think there are other things at work here as well um, that, that play into why the Midwest, I think, will continue to be an important place for tech uh, innovation and economic growth in the future. And I think the folks in Ohio, I mean, I don't know uh, Pittsburgh or in Pennsylvania as well, but the folks in, in Ohio, I think, recognize this. And so they're trying to figure out what are some things that they can do to support industry and help uh, accelerate economic growth here. So two things on that. One is you're doing a smart thing by being right in the shadow of Ohio State University, which makes it a lot easier to bring those people who are studying or, or researching the, the new hot thing, right? Um, but I, I also think, as, as sort of a second idea there, and this, this should be a question, this shouldn't be a statement. I, I'll see if you, if you feel the same way. A lot of this starts with older folks in the region saying, I don't want my kids to move away. And then the politicians and the people that have the power say, well, what can we do to keep that from happening? And they go, well, I don't know. He seems to like computers, right? Like it's, it starts off from a position of sort of broad marketing of how do I get Mrs. Smith to vote for me? And she goes, oh, well, my dearest Philip is very important to me and I don't want him to move to Silicon Valley. Is there anything we can do? And it, it starts off with that. And then we say, okay, well, yeah, we don't want to be thought of as a place where industry used to be. And then from there, it, it starts to grow legs. What fascinates me, what is absolutely like I needed to talk to you was the collaboratory turns that a little bit around and says these CEOs and the CIO CTOs that work on the product development and whatnot, they were on board at a very early stage before these innovative kind of models were anywhere to be copied or, or, or or checked on. I'm I'm dying to know sort of how these large corporate executives all ended up on the same page. Yeah, well, and they didn't have it all figured out at the time, but they were all drawn together by some common interest. They knew that the business leaders knew they wanted to support the local economic developers and partner with them to find a way to drive uh, economic activity and jobs and whatnot. The corporations were dealing with common challenges in cybersecurity and advanced analytics, the two technical areas where we operate. In cybersecurity, of course, there's a common enemy they're, defined, they're, um, they're defending against. In analytics, and this has been a moving target, uh, um, but they're all struggling in their own way with how do they inject AI into their businesses and make it a part of their business. Right. So I believe the hypothesis, which I think has largely been proven correct, was by sharing knowledge and experiences, they can short circuit the learning loop and they can accelerate their advancement along the maturity curve and get there faster than they could otherwise on their own. You know, collaboration is really a force multiplier. Yes, it is. 
especially when you recognize, when you have self-awareness to know what you do have and do not have in your own personal toolbox. That's right. So these seven large, sophisticated companies probably would not have otherwise gotten together or been able to practically get together were it not for a shared interest around innovation and attracting talent, the commitment from their CEOs right. to partner with local economic developers to make it viable. Which is, in my view, the most remarkable piece because of how hard it is to make that happen yeah. just in general. Just getting them into the same place on a conversation is difficult when you've got organizations of that size. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a third leg of this. And I like to refer to it as strong economic ties. But these seven companies didn't just decide to get together and to share experiences. They invested. They became co-investors in an entity that is a for-profit entity. And then they put the CIOs generally, there's some there's some edge cases, but generally the CIOs on the board and the CIOs were a very and have been a very collegial group. Yeah. So it starts at the top and it works its way down. And and the last leg of this that I would add is is that they all shared a common goal for the company to become a sustainable for-profit entity. Right. So so I think that last piece, the economic and the legal structure of this helped to bind these partners together for the longer term, to build long-term value as opposed to short-term value and some of those things in addition to being non you know not competing with one another. Right. You know, they they don't compete with one another. I think those are the things that have helped to bring these other these large companies who otherwise probably wouldn't have found a practical way to to work together. So, let's go down the roster. You have an American Electric Power. Very good. Patel mm -hmm. Memorial Institute, Cardinal Health, Huntington Bank, L Brands, okay. Nationwide Insurance, and Ohio Health. There you go. Um, Heard of them. Several household names. Right. Um, leaders in their industries, some global companies. Right. And yet, despite all that, generally, there is not a, a, a large amount of competitive overlap if at all. Right. But what's also, I, I, I just keep coming back to this, this intersection of like their size and the out of the boxness of the idea. Right. <laughs> um, well, I wasn't here when the idea was first conceived, but there are a couple of three thought leaders that were really driving this hard. Um, and it was really a combination of couple of CIOs were very passionate about it, yeah. economic developers. Uh, one, for example, uh, Kenny McDonald, who's the CEO of Columbus 2020, sits on our board okay. uh, as one of the observers. So he has for four years now been a part of all of our board meetings, and he's right in it. And nice. that's a deep level of partnership with folks who – uh, are focused on a mission that is complementary to, but very different than ours. Yes. Right. And uh, several of the CIOs that were really the passionate pushers behind it went on the board as well. Now, fascinating thing, and this is a test of our model, we've had very high turnover in the board. Very okay. high. More than a majority of the board has turned It surprises over. me. Yeah, I mean, even have you say that, honestly. Typically, that's the kind of thing that people would try to sweep under the rug but but they've turned over because they retired okay see there it is you know and and um yet despite that we've managed to continue to renew you know the the uh representation on the board with very senior level executive sponsorship from these companies right uh and uh so far um it has i think the board has continued to be um have a healthy amount of skepticism, which they should. That's oh, their absolutely. duty. That's your job. But they work very, very well together, and and they are shooting for the a common target. That's cool. It's beautiful in its scale, mm -hmm. and everyone involved should take the credit. I mean that that's. I'm not blowing smoke when I say like I don't know how many times out of a thousand that would happen. Given everything else, everything else being the same, I don't know how many times that manifests itself the way it did here. Well, negotiating the agreements was fun. I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, every part of this, you told me before we got started, you have an M&A background. You know this more than almost anybody I've ever spoken to. Yeah, yeah. You know how there's a legal department. There is a, 
uh, intellectual property department. There is a security and sort of like, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, risk management kind of an aspect to it. Every department has something to say about something like they call it opening the kimono, but that, that frankly doesn't sound anywhere near scaled up enough to, to properly describe what happens here. Right now, your, your eighth company, the collaboratory itself, right? Who are their clients? Who, who buys the say cybersecurity and, and analytics things that come out of here? Well, so it's important to understand the model. Okay. So these seven companies invested, right? but these are not financial investors. Right. They're not VCs who speculatively put money into a company because they want to exit it right. as yeah. a giant multiple in five years. Okay. Um, they put money in it because they wanted to derive the operational benefit out of the company yes. that they could get. Right. So they themselves are the first quote unquote customers. That makes sense. Of, of the company. It's just because they invested their money and uh, in, in now two rounds they were in the first position and we decided to treat that as prepayment on products and services. Oh, that's really smart. Yeah. And the reason we did that, or in hindsight, I think that the, one of the really tremendous benefits that came from that is think about this. We did not have to business case justify every single project we would do with the operational units inside these companies. Right. Can you imagine? So the finance it's, organization- It's an avalanche of, of an administration. Right. The, the finance organization puts money in the in the company, and then you go to the operating units, and you're trying to get money out of their budgets in the early going of the company. Well, you'd have to- you know, you'd have to work awfully hard to business case justify these projects with a company that doesn't even have any reputation. So yeah, prepayment allowed us to earn our way into these large companies, yeah. prove ourselves, and then demonstrate the value of what we were doing. Mm-hmm. Now, those were, that was the original seven. The way the model works is we identify common challenges that they have. We and understand the what what they're dealing with in every you know current contemporary cyber defense and in applying AI to their business. Then we prototype solutions against those. They adopt them after we get to a certain level of vetting and and efficacy you know that we can prove. Yeah. We then roll those out into the market. And part of the mission of the company was let's benefit the region. Not right. just by attracting talent to the region, not just by making our seven original companies stronger, more competitive, but by also making uh, companies in the region more secure mm-hmm. and help, helping them to become more competitive as well. So, no one's going to know more about cybersecurity than a bank. I mean, or, you just or can't. a power company or an, or a uh, an insurance company. Yeah, right? I mean, <laughs> we, well, I just take a look at it in terms of like, okay, if my doctor's office, right, someone who is a small they're probably not actually a sole proprietor, but for the purposes of this analogy, they are. They don't have what it takes to get that level of sophistication, but inside my doctor's office is a treasure trove of social security numbers and medical records and all kinds of different things that can be sold and weaponized and otherwise used against. That's a doctor's office, right? That's about as pedestrian as you're going to get as an example. Yeah. So when you look at Huntington Bank, when you look at nationwide, when you look at a yeah, power company is actually a much better example than I even realized until I gave it a second thought. We may, we used to make jokes 20 years ago that all, every salesperson through the door would say mission critical. You remember this? Like every, every sales rep would go like, and I'm here to help your mission critical functions, right? <laughs> well, we've seen what can happen when a large household name has a breach That's in right. cyber, right? That is dictionary definition of mission critical at that point, because if people will not do business with you, the mission's over. Um, so it's, it's interesting now that my doctor's office or whomever else that's actually a, an appropriate, uh, person for your regional benefit argument that you're making, they get to plug into a much, much higher level of sophistication. And if I may, a much, much lower barrier to entry is what I'm assuming. Yeah. Well, I I think that's, I think it's right. We still have to, we have to convince them. We have to earn their trust. Yeah. But I think when they see seven uh, large, sophisticated organizations working with us and adopting certain products and services, and they have confidence that there must be something to it, 
uh, right. for themselves, and that gives us an opportunity to demonstrate it to them. Yeah, and and so I think, and, and you know, those those company names are known throughout the region, so we, we can um, we can suggest that you know some of the things we're doing generally. Of course, we can't be specific. Uh, have already been tried and tested by these larger companies, and they can benefit as well. So our model is we help those companies in our region, and then we're, we're expanding outward from there. Right. And I think that creates a bit of a virtuous cycle because as we then commercialize, that generates additional uh, revenues for the company that we can use to sustain the operation and build further upon the innovations that, that we have already produced, which are uh, quite interesting already. One of the things that I take away, though, from the barrier to entry aspect of this conversation is there's a great deal of confusion in both of your focus areas about what to do, how to do it, what order to do it in. And some of it is, for I'm, lack of a better term, I'm going to use the word over disruption, right? Like the last model wasn't quite finished and somebody else comes in and Kool-Aid mans through the wall and goes, no, that's not how you do it. We're going to completely wipe the old paradigm off the wall. And people haven't even had an opportunity to adopt the last one. So what you end up with is chaos. It's just a ball of spaghetti and no one knows what revision of cybersecurity mindset are we on today? How long is it going to take to implement and how long till the next disruption where everything is garbage, right? That's right. So you, you guys are kind of moving together and you're saying like, okay, we're only, we're only sailing in one direction. <laughs> we're using this methodology as we iterate, as we improve upon it, we'll go ahead and nip and tuck around it for you. But I think We've had probably, I would say, three or four different cybersecurity practitioners and, and providers of different stripes on the show. And the number one thing I keep coming back to is if I were a 10-person operation just trying to keep the lights on, how would I know what to buy? Yeah. I think you're solving that. Well, there is tremendous noise in the market. Yeah. Um, and and a lot of players. and. We are we are very very results oriented in our DNA, and that's probably because of how we were formed and who sits on our board. We were mm -hmm. not designed to invest in five year out research projects, which could have tremendous upside value. Right, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that, but our folks wanted to get value out of us now, so we're very wired around. You get better the day after you're done with us. So if you think about this in cybersecurity, and let me frame it in, in that context for a second, uh, the one of the two technical areas we're really uh, most active in, we really follow a cycle. And the cycle starts with a philosophical view of offense and form defense. So what that means is, is we really are looking at where are the places companies are getting hurt today. And we prioritize that and we use threat intelligence to inform that. So if I walk you through what we offer, I think this will make sense in a second. We formed an information sharing and analysis organization where threat intel practitioners get together and they share information. And then there's some tooling that they can share that through to make it more efficient. That informs our attacker teams who will then pick out what are the types of attacks that are most likely to uh, or you're most likely to get hurt by, yeah. and they can offer those attacks in a controlled environment. That allows you to then observe how are your defenses detecting and responding to those. So our offensive team goes in and offers an attack. Then we work with these companies to observe the, the attack, the, the uh, ability to detect. Our data scientists now are building models that allow us to detect the specific attack phenomenon, when it occurs in their specific environment, yeah. which have highly, highly tuned models. Then we work with the, uh, with the customer to actually tune their controls so that they can detect and respond to that attack when it occurs. And we, we can work with them uh, in, a, in an informed way because we also assist with some vulnerability management you know, vulnerability scanning so we understand where their vulnerabilities are and help them prioritize where some of that is, uh, some of the remediation should take place. And then we measure that impact. So we can say, okay, here was what your baseline was before. Right. Here was the attack that Threat Intel said that you're likely to get hurt by. Our offensive teams offered the attack. We detected it. We adjusted these controls. Here's how you're better that day. And then we feed that back into the loop again. 
Right. And that approach is something that is extremely practical. It's very now. It's very real world. Yeah. And we believe and we claim that it increases the ROI on your security spend. Because the problem is the, the bad guys are getting more sophisticated. They're using AI just like we're using AI. Right. They're becoming more efficient. And um, there's not an unlimited amount of funds, even though these companies are pouring huge amounts of money into cyber. Well, there's not an unlimited amount of money. Well, there, there's... There's a lot at risk. Yeah. You did such a lovely job explaining everything, and I'm going to go lowbrow with you for a second. <laughs> I am reminded of an episode of Family Guy where they asked Lois how much it would cost for them to feel safe again when she was running for president, and she just kept saying 9-11 over and over again. She's like, I'm running for office, and she just goes like, terrorism, 9-11. <laughs> and, and the guy gets up, and he goes, oh, my goodness, how much will it cost for me to feel safe again? There is an unscrupulous sector that, is intentionally creating what you and I back in a hundred years ago used to call FUD, right? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt, where you just go like, well, what are you doing about hackers, right? And it's like you're waiting for the person who does the the scoring of the movie to go, dun, dun, dun. Dark because, hoodie appears. Because all they have to do is ask the question, yeah, right? They don't have to give you the answer. And at the risk of telling you your business, it kind of feels like people are burned out on fear and instead are turning towards people that are saying like, okay, here's how we're going to eradicate that fear with a systematized process. It's not that you shouldn't be worried that you're going to be exploited. It's that coming in and just stirring the pot and getting your people all riled up is useless as a business practice and you should keep people out of your office when they do that. Well, the market is definitely segmented. Yeah. So at the top end, they get it. Their boards are all, you know, they have risk committees and they're hiring cyber professionals to be on their boards and mm -hmm. they're going to the conferences and, and they're scoring themselves and doing assessments and all that. At the extreme other end of the market, there's a bit of paralysis because the cost of entry is so high. I mean, you, yeah. you can't get the people. It's very expensive to create a capability. So there's a little bit of what should I do? Right. You know, if, if I have a very, very limited amount of money to spend on it, where am I going to get my biggest bang for the buck? And then in the middle is a continuum of companies. And I do think, by and large, there's just so much. You can't pick up a newspaper today without reading about this stuff. So I think, No, that's true. We know, are numb to it almost. I think it's less of an event now, a compliance-oriented event. I mean, for sure, there's a, a compliance angle. But, you know, let me look at my business. Oh, I've got these vulnerabilities. Oh, let's fix them. Okay, we're good. Right. It's a way of life now because it's an existential threat to the business, large or small. Right. And I think companies now are trying to get comfortable with what's the level of investment they can sustain to make it a way of life in their business. But here's an example of another element of this. An awful lot of the cyber breaches and the damages that result are just from a lack of attention to the basic blocking and tackling that of patching is. systems. No matter what it is. Right? So you can eliminate a lot of your cyber risk just by updating the, the operating system software and a lot of your devices. We could reduce the electrical bill at my house if my kids could learn to use a light switch, right? <laughs> right. Like, it's always a user. Yeah. That's, that's the reality that we're moving to, is the fact that we've created so much complexity that the computers are now going to have to run the computers because we have decided that we can't remember to turn off the light switch. We've decided that we can't remember our password. So there's an entire cottage industry devoted to remembering your password and generating your password and now automatically regenerating and re-remembering your new password that you didn't have any involvement with. Well, here's the news, the headline news. I think it's going to get become more complex in the future, not that, less. That's a lovely introduction to the ai part of this conversation <laughs> right. isn't it it is I, i'm kind of proud of us i'm trying to help you out here. i'm kind of proud of us <laughs> um we had a gentleman by the name of john providence come through his uh his company is eagle dream technologies they're the number one amazon web services reseller in the northeast u.s they've got major brand names and you would expect John to come in and go, yeah, you want to buy AI because that's what John's company helps you do is to get AI into your business. And then he said something shockingly simple. And he just said, when you finally decide to do it, how long is it going to take you to catch up with everybody else? And I, my eyebrows kind of went up and I said, that is a strong argument. At lunch today, I was talking with someone else who said, the reason that internet banking and internet services became popular was because 
they didn't have to tear out the old inefficiencies. They were native to that efficient environment. I don't know how you even start a conversation. You as the collaboratory, I don't even know how you start a conversation with people on analytics and, and machine learning and, and, and those kinds of things. Well, it's the barriers to entry or the costs of entry can be high and the risk can be high depending on how you choose to do it. So one of the things we like to do is to say, let us help you. You have to build a, a, a more data-driven business if you want to become digital. Absolutely. You've got to figure out ways to automate and, yes, be secure in the process. But we believe strongly in not only helping to lower that cost of entry, but also in showing the art of the possible, particularly in areas that have been traditionally underserved by technologies like analytics and AI. For example, finance. You know, there's a lot of benefit uh, in being able to, to predict uh, financial performance and being able to predict customer attrition and being able to predict um, what the performance of a portfolio of projects is likely to be. Are they going to overrun cost or underrun cost? That's just an example. There are parallel examples in customer service and, and in HR and on and on and on and on. Yeah. So we like to say, we we would like to help you progress along that journey. We're a big believer in incrementalism, incremental approaches. There there's there's a time and a place for the big bangs, but we're about tightly defined use cases where we have a problem, we have a data set, we build a prototype, and we try to progress that to a state where it can have real near-term impact. And what that does is not only does it help to financially justify it, but it helps these companies build up kind of muscle around this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because it's practice this feels so that's right. so important. Yes, because the first time out, you don't know even how it gets written. Um, well, is this something that's bought off the shelf or is it something that's done in house? Well, are we going to have a major process change or is it going to just kind of do itself? Is it going to be a monthly fee that we're going to start looking at every month, rolling our eyes about, or did we buy it forever? Until you know the answers to those things, your willingness and appetite for a heavy lift are very low. <laughs> Let me throw you another one, uh, throw another one at you. Do I use open source or not? Right. You know, we have the big platform players, yeah. IBM and Amazon and Microsoft, and they are all, you know, commercializing very sophisticated, you know, Right. Uh, capabilities through microservices, but the open source movement is phenomenal in this area. You know, the other thing about AI is, is AI is not necessarily always, it's not the means, you know, or it's not the end in and of itself. Right. It's hard to be a player in the game, right? It, it's very easy to be the screaming fan. Uh, so I'm in Columbus, so I may as well make a Blue Jackets reference, right? Like uh, the Penguins and the Blue Jackets, you know, met up last night. And just like us, you have those fans in the stands who go shoot the puck. Like all of a sudden, everyone is Scotty Bowman. Everyone is the like the greatest coach of all time when they're in the hockey rink. Right. But shooting the puck may not necessarily be the right thing. The reason they're screaming shoot the puck is because they don't have any skin in the game. Right. Do AI is the is the machine learning equivalent of shoot the puck. It's just like easy drive by throwaway advice that I'm not accountable for and no one cares if I'm right. Well, in, in, let me, if I can, let me just amplify the point you're making, which I think is so important. In order to build models that have high accuracy, you got to have data you can rely on. Right. So a lot of what we're finding is a lot of companies are not where they need to be at all about understanding what is the data they have internally, what is third-party source data, how reliable is it. Right. What's the data that is going into the model? Is it a source that I want to rely on or not? So there's a lot that goes into shooting the puck. Before we, before we jump out of here, um, how can people find the Collaboratory on the web? You can go to uh, columbuscollaboratory.com. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah, we have a <laughs> – it's not complicated. I'm a big fan. <laughs> uh, you, you can go to our website, and there's a contact page. And you know we'd love to hear from companies that really – uh, are aspirational. Yeah. They want to figure out how to increase the ROI of their security investments. They want to figure out how to incorporate AI in their business. And uh, you know they would like to become a part of something where collaboration is a shared value and is something that can be uh, you know an accelerant for the business. I've got to get you to Pittsburgh. 
I appreciate you taking the time. Hey, thanks for inviting me. It was fun. All right, that's all the time we've got. Thank you to Matt and everybody at the Columbus Collaboratory. We're trying to uh, schedule something where Matt and the gang can come out to Pittsburgh and maybe tell us a little bit more, maybe do a little Q&A, that sort of a thing. If you're in town, I think that'd be fun. I don't know. Maybe we'll get that done. In the meantime, Buzzy and I are going to make another Pitchworks podcast. It will be out next Wednesday. Subscribers get it first. Make sure you subscribe now if you're not already. The Pitchworks podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart, LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit pitchworks.com. P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.com. On social media, find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.